Thank you very much for joining us for our first conversation in the Women in Governance series. I'm Anakshi Sopti, and I have the privilege of leading Asia Society's operations in South Asia. I'd like to say a few words on why we're here today by starting with an example. In August this year, Indira Jai Singh wrote to the Chief Justice of India about the stereotyping faced by lawyers who are women. She cited her own experiences ranging from patronizing remarks that she was delightful to being told outright that she was too aggressive when she argued like a man ordinarily would. Indira Jai Singh has had a long and illustrious career as an advocate and a human rights activist. But her experience of this career has been shaped by her identity as a woman. She was the first woman to be designated a senior advocate by the Bombay High Court in 1986. A 2023 report found that almost 40 years later, less than 4% of all senior advocates are women. So what are the journeys of working women in South Asia? What kind of courage does it take to live in a world of deep cognitive biases? And what does it take to make a new world piece by piece? How does a gendered experience of the world change the world the way you live in it? These are the questions we want to ask. And I'm thrilled to have with us Karuna Nandi and Hina Jilani, two feisty and accomplished lawyers from the subcontinent who've been at the forefront of advocacy for women and the marginalized. Nothing seems to deter them, neither hostile propaganda, intimidation, nor public abuse. Karuna Nandi is an international lawyer and advocate in the Supreme Court of India. She's been leading the fight to criminalize marital rape in India, represents the victims of the Bhopal gas tragedy, and has petitioned to legalize queer marriage on grounds of freedom to express sexual preference. Hina Jalani is a lawyer who founded and chairs the Human Rights Commission of Pakistan. She founded Pakistan's first all-women legal firm in Lahore with her sister Asma Jahangir. Both Karuna and Hina have several accol accolades to their credit. Both Hina and Karuna have done pioneering work in gender and human rights and used their position in law and governance to impact and shape legal frameworks in India and Pakistan. I am so excited to hear from them. Just a note of housekeeping before we start, today is an unmoderated conversation that will run until 6.45 p.m. The discussants will be happy to include questions from all of you thereafter if you post them in the Q&A box. We hope to close by 7 p.m. And with that, over to you both, Karuna and Hina. It's a pleasure and an honor. Thank you, Inakshi, to be in this conversation at the Asia Society with Hina Jilani, who is has become a valued friend and also colleague on uh, uh, the high-level media panel that we both serve on. Um, I have found not just with Hina, but also other colleagues from Pakistan that we meet um, predominantly, you know, in uh, international fora and earlier in India that there are not just so many cultural sim similarities, but we also have a common colonial legal heritage. So we all have the a version of the penal code that came in in 1860. Pakistan has the Pakistan Penal Code, and we have the Indian Penal Code. That has that is of course riddled with um, heteropatriarchy amongst other issues. Um, but over to Hina for opening remarks, and then we can just chat. Well, hello, Inakshi and Karuna. Um, I must begin by thanking Asia Society for organizing um, uh, this uh, event and for giving me the opportunity of talking to one of my favorite people, uh, Karuna, and to hearing from her and sharing my own experiences, how we as women and as lawyers have been able to contribute perhaps to the solidification of uh, the rule of law within the democratic um, 
uh, structures that we have in both our countries, which are quite different, I, I acknowledge, but we can speak about them when we are holding this conversation. So it's going to be a pleasure. I look forward to uh, talking to you. And I hope that what both of you, we have to say will be of interest generally to uh, everyone, but also specifically to those who are engaged in the same kind of work that we do, which is um, women's rights and law for change um, bringing in change, looking after the rights of the more vulnerable communities in our both in both our countries, um, and there are many of those. I would love to hear Hina about um, what you saw as the challenges when you began your work, um, and where you think we are today. Because of course there are movements both ways. I think in about. Um, I want to say 2012-ish, about 2007 to 2012, I had the feeling that things were only getting better. But that's really not true, sadly, right? Because you have pushbacks in multiple ways. You have pushbacks from um, so-called men's rights associations. You have pushbacks from uh, those who are oppressive of one group of women or queer folk. So I'd love to I'd love to hear about where you felt we all, you know, where the women's movement in Pakistan and globally was back in the day and now. You know, um, I started um, practicing law in 1977. And if you know Pakistan's history, you would know that uh, this is the period when uh, we had recently had um, another coup d'etat in our country. And the constitution was set in abeyance. So there was no, uh, um, you know, no prospect for a young lawyer like my, me uh, going to courts on constitutional issues. Um, my first, um, you know, uh, pupillage was with uh, one of the most famous uh, lawyers in the, in the field of criminal law. So I started doing criminal law at that time. And I had the opportunity, uh, this is just by the way, a few years later to go to India uh, in a legal conference. And to my embarrassment, there was nothing that I could talk about at that conference uh, about the constitution. And I was looking with envy at many of my contemporary uh, you know, um, lawyers in the in the legal field, and thinking, what are we going to do if we are called upon at any time to look at the constitution and bring in all the issues that I had begun to deal with by that time as a human rights and a women's rights activist? What are we going to do? How are we going to strategize? How are we going to use the constitution? We had a fairly good constitution in 1973, which we still have, luckily. But um, the courts, the power of the courts to enforce fundamental rights had been suspended for many years while I was, uh, you know, about, while I was practicing in the early years of my becoming a lawyer. So that's one thing I envy my contemporaries in, a, 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 in a lawyers in the, in the Indian um, uh, legal fraternity. So the, 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 Time that I was working as a as a as a uh, lawyer, and there came a time when I thought, you know, um, I was uh, in the chambers of one of those famous lawyers, and then I thought, you know, I need to set up something on my own. Luckily, I found three more partners, and we set up the um, all women law firm, which was the first one in Pakistan. Now, unlike uh, Indira Jaising. I don't think any of the judges or any of our legal colleagues, um, you know, raised our raised their brow eyebrows at us, but they were very amused to see women coming into the court. Um, Asma and I were perhaps the, one of the earliest uh, lawyers to start practicing in the in the, the Lahore High Court and in the lower courts. And I think they had this attitude of a lot, li little bit of patroni patronizing us and thinking, okay, they have come, they'll go away in a little while. 
I think they were fairly disappointed and a bit, a bit apprehensive on what we are going to do in the courts uh, when they saw that we are not going away anytime soon. And this was also a period when very sensitive issues had arisen. Pakistan was undergoing not only a very repressive military uh, dictatorship, but also Islamization of laws. And these, is, uh, these, this Islamization surge had in many ways encompassed the rights of women in particular. I'd been going to prison and working in prisons even before I became a lawyer because my father had been a political prisoner for many times in his life as a politician. So I had this kind of, that had, that, that had somehow inspired me to go and work with prisoners and especially political prisoners. And in that context, I was visiting women in prison. And suddenly I realized that because of these new Islamic laws that had come in, the population of prison, women in prison really surged. And that's when it struck me that something has gone wrong. Frankly, I had not even paid attention uh, to the promulgation of these laws at that time, till that time. And then I started working out why these women were coming to court and what was the, you know, the real problem with these laws and how women's liberty was being um, uh, denied them because of very, uh, you know, strange um, ideas that um, this Islamization um, wave was bringing in and how the laws were being polluted. So that's how it began. That's where my interest came. Because being a lawyer, by this time we had already set up our law firm, and which was meant to be a law firm, a normal law firm, doing a, you know, a normal paid practice. And then suddenly this became also a legal aid center for women. And we were then taking up cases of women who had become victims of these Islamic laws and other uh, un, uh, uh, unfair laws. Um, especially in the area of family law. So that's how my interest, uh, not only in practicing law to, to give women empowerment, but also in order to see that women are recognized as citizens of this country. And we, I was very keen for a time and a period when the constitution and the guarantees of fundamental freedoms given in the constitution could be used to give that protection, not just to women, but also to other vulnerable and marginalized communities in our very unequal society. Were there so many women then? Because, I mean, interestingly, of course, the fundamental rights in this country were suspended as well. And then that suspension by Indira Gandhi at the time was approved by our Supreme Court. It was a dark, dark history uh, during that time. Now the struggles are different equally important, but different. Um, were the large number of women that were, came into prison suddenly during that time because of the change in, partly because of the change in the rape laws and because of the hudud and zina provisions in Sharia, which then said that if you allege rape against someone and you can't find those four witnesses, then you have admitted to a sexual act and therefore you must go to jail. Is th was that a part of it? That, that was very much a part of it because the, this law was then used as a tool by the women's own families or other families who, were, uh, who had some issue with a particular family to accuse a woman from that, uh, um, um, you know, that enemy family. Uh, to to put them in jail using these allegations of uh, zina, which is um, um, extramarital sex with consent, and then of course there were those who were uh, who were committing the crime of rape and and uh, could get away with it, whereas the victim suffered, and there were many young girls who suffered because of this. So you can understand, Karuna, that when. You know, you've had your emergency, and I'd be very uh, uh, happy to hear what happened to uh, the society at large and uh, the rule of law in your country. 
when that happened. But in our country, you, you understand the emergency of Indira Gandhi must have been a very repressive moment for all of you. But this was not anything compared to a military dictatorship where the freedom of assembly, the freedom of association, the freedom of speech, and, any, and the freedom of movement was totally, totally denied. It, these were some of our blackest days. We've had so many uh, military coups, but this one, which lasted for 11 years, was one of the worst. Yeah. But tell I, me a little bit, yeah. tell me a little bit about your journey, uh, how you got into this whole issue of defending uh, those uh, that that were disempowered, defending women de and, and taking up so many of these cases, like the Bhopal case, for instance. Yeah. Um. Well, I've been at it now. I'm 47. So I've been at it now for uh, 22, 23 years. Um, I think that being born into societies like ours, where there is extreme inequality and also there's an ext it's the, the nature of injustice is also extreme. Plus, I think there's the fact that if you are born into these societies as a woman, but a privileged woman, then you kind of see both sides. Mm -hmm. And so the question that all of us subliminally or explicitly have to answer for ourselves is, how do we for ourselves resolve that um, divide, resolve that cognitive dissonance? And people do it in different ways. So some people just ignore it. And I think are uh, worse for it because then you are, I think internally being harmed by the fact that you are closing yourself off and inuring yourself to, um, the kind of atrocity and injustice that is around you. There are others who deal with these issues through art or policy or even philanthropy, giving away quietly a section of their earnings every month. You know, even people who are actually not that well off, even people who are um, middle class or low middle class who find mm -hmm. that kind of generosity. Um, for me, it was my parents were. Uh, a, a real guiding light in this regard because my father taught at Cambridge for many years and then was a, um, was at Mass General and he was being offered a tenure track position when, um, and my mother was at the LSE and got, you know, the history prize at the LSE was, you know, then pursuing her MPhil and then PhD. And this, they all decided to uh, come back and serve. And at that time, it was not so unusual because at the moment we see a lot of a drain the other way. Um, but at that time, I think there were a lot of people who were really excited about serving uh, in an India that was still quite new. And so my, my dad came back to Ames and my mother founded the... Uh, what was then the Spastic Society of Northern India. And I saw the joy that they got from pursuing a vocation and from pursuing a vocation that connected them to so many people in a way that was positive and flourishing. Um, so I think for me, it was quite clear. I went to Cambridge and then Columbia. For me, it was quite clear that I was always going to come back. Um, but I always also knew that I wanted to fund my um, pro bono work through my regular matters. And I really enjoy my commercial work as well. Um, and so my first degree is in economics and throughout I also studied commercial law and transnational litigation and arbitration. And um, so that's still primarily the, the way in which it's done. Though of course now, when you are, you know, doing work for governments or the UN, I mean, that's also that's also another way in which you power you and fuel your uh, pro bono work. It's it's hard though. It's yeah. the the bigger challenges. I mean, they're tough. And what we're up against is 
is very entrenched. I mean, it's not just the patriarchy. It's in the Bhopal cases, it's the the corporate governmental nexuses across the world. Uh, even the Obama government, for instance, had an assistant secretary of state write a memo to one of our government people saying, why don't you just get rid of this Bhopal business, right? And so the, the big hairy challenges I find, and litigation in general, whether you're a man or a woman or anyone, but, um, but I think particularly if you're a woman or a queer person or a Dalit person, um, requires the kind of dedication and grit that is not taught in our law schools and I think should be taught in our law schools, right? I mean, just purely adjournments, for example. Yeah, but yesterday, you know, I was in, um, I'll just finish this point and then over to, and I have so many questions to ask you based on this, but um, I was arguing a case in the Ahmedabad High Court and there was a lawyer with cerebral palsy that I'd not seen that before, a woman lawyer with cerebral palsy. And it wasn't extreme cerebral palsy, but um, it was sort of mild to moderate. And she won her case. And so I think that even though we have to work harder, even though we have to work better and be better, to uh, to do well, um, the fact that those wins are there, and the fact that there are those within and without there to power us and each other to break those doors down and to open those doors from the inside, I think that's heartening and inspiring. Um, so, what keeps you inspired today, still? You know, when you were talking, uh, I had this feeling that, you know, I'm not alone in thinking that even though our journeys may have been difficult because of the kind of work that we do, not because I'm a woman lawyer, I don't think I had many problems there. It was very soon that after I started practicing that the judges and the legal fraternity did start respecting us and our, 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 our work. But at the same time, the environment in which we, we started the work and the kind of mindsets we had to fight, and these are the judicial mindsets that I'm telling you, in order not just to attain justice, but also to give access to people to justice. It had become a very difficult and painful uh, uh, journey for us. It still is, even today. But you said, you know, we have to... Um, work hard, etc. Yes, we have to have a very difficult life and our work does consume most of our, our, our time, but we also have to have a very thick skin. And I think Excellent. many of the judges that I now meet uh, at my age and after they have also retired, they smile and they tell us that if anything, what we remember always about you is that you've been very persistent. So, um, uh, and I told them, I mean, we have a word in Urdu, which is not a very complimentary word, uh, which they used uh, rather than this yes. sophisticated word, chicha. Yes. So <laughs> I told them, look, I have to be there, or I had to be there for those whose voices in any case were not being heard. And if I had raised expectations by saying that we will bring you to the courts of law and try and get you what you are uh, entitled to under the law and the constitution of Pakistan. And here I must say that once our constitution was restored and um, uh, we had this opportunity after Zia al Haq's period to go to court and enforce fundamental rights for people, we did have many, many successes. So even though things were difficult, there were times when uh, we had to have a thick skin and a lot of patience with the judiciary. But I'm happy to say that there's not even a moment of my life as a litigator or as a human rights defender that I regret. And even though things are pretty bad, they are not as bad as they were when we started. And we did find certain areas in which we could bring change or at least some 
uh, progress for some of the more uh, you know vulnerable communities that we live amongst in in my country and I'm sure in yours too. And I think what I can say about women's rights litigation, painful, very painful. We had to have a lot of patience before we got success, but we did get success. Uh, where I think I felt that the pain was less, but the journey was difficult, was in other kind of situations where we, after thousands of petitions of habeas corpus for bonded labor, victims of bonded labor, then came the time that uh, we were able to go to the Supreme Court in a public interest litigation on this issue. It went on for so long because there were so many powerful people who were, you know, uh, uh, the perpetrators in this case. Uh, you can see the feudal aristocracy in our country who are also very powerful politicians, the military um, uh, generals in some cases, some of the judges had brick kilns in which they were taking bonded labor. Many of them had lands where they were taking this kind of uh, 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 bonded labor. So it was a very difficult journey uh, in that respect. Uh, and those were difficult cases, but we won them. And because of that, several legislations over the years have now come in. Um, we haven't been able to implement the laws in this country that would have completely freed people from exploitation. But at least now we have laws and they have given us a foothold into the legal system. And we can go there and at least try our luck to fight against the powerful elements that hold back the guarantees of freedom that the constitution gives us. I sometimes look at India and compare the social scene and then the legislative framework. And I feel that the social scene is the same. The legislative framework is not very much better than ours. You have good laws, we have some good laws as well. What I believe, and you can correct me if I say this, uh, what I believe is institutions are stronger. And perhaps the, uh, the political environment may be the same. We still have corrupt politicians and you do too. Not many politicians are really concerned and genuinely concerned about the plight of the people, but you know, parliaments have functioned for 75 years in your country. In our country, parliaments do not function all the time. And there are gaps like 10, 11 years when military governments are there and either there is no parliament or if there is one, it's a selected one. As far as the courts are concerned, we have had a very checkered history uh, of the courts as well. So these are some of the things that I think we have found as challenges in our um, struggle against exploitation, in our struggle against empowering women and empowering uh, others. So it, when I was speaking to you, there was one thing that I thought, you know, as uh, women's rights champions, as lawyers taking women's rights cases, violence against women, empowerment, non-discrimination cases, uh, and, and I've done many of those also, uh, and have there are there are landmark cases uh, that I did in which women's equality and non-discrimination was um, well recognized now and acknowledged, and those are cases that are now cited. But then comes a period where people start thinking about you as a person who does a certain kind of work. So for you. You did the Bhopal case, which was a big constitutional case. It was also a case about social and economic rights of the population, not just their right to life and physical security. So then that is something that I think women lawyers also need to think about. Women's rights prosper only if you have a healthy society and a healthy judicial system and a respect for the constitution that your courts must um, 
enforce and also, uh, you know, uh, respect the constitution themselves. Yeah. I mean, it's funny you say that because I was talking to a colleague yesterday and about, um, you know, an honor that someone, we were talking about an honor that was possibly on the cards. And they said that, you know, ma'am, if you get it or if you don't get it, people are going to talk, right? Like people are going to say something both ways. So this thing that you said about having a thick skin, I think is fundamental. Yes. Because um, with because people are... Let me give you an example. Um, I have always done... A, a lot of commercial property, other work, um, a general, uh, you know, a general practice and intentionally so because in a conversation I had with a sort of similar conversation I had with Fali Nariman, um, he's, he had said to me a long time ago and we discussed it in our televised chat that it doesn't make sense at the Supreme Court level to specialize. Reason being that, um, if you have a hammer, you see every problem as a nail. Of course, as life goes along and as the decades pass, you end up doing a few strands of work that are quite specialist. So um, I was doing a fair bit of, you know, a lot of commercial work and I was doing a lot of women's rights work, a lot of media law work uh, and free speech work. So media law is the, is the, aspect where you're advising media organizations and the free speech is the other constitutional cases and sometimes frequently they overlap. Um, at some point about in about 2010, as my constitutional work and my international law work started to get public recognition, um, my commercial work started to fall by the wayside. And people, because people wanted to slot one as this or that or something else. And that was a moment of some bemusement, you know, to me, because it's a bit like, um, it, it's yet another thing that one has to displace and get over. But I think something that worked for me also was that Around that time, I also decided that I was not going to play by the rules of the old boys club. Mm -hmm. that I was going to um, listen to my conscience and have respect, due respect for the institutions that I'm a part of. Um, but the aspect of it that is just old boys clubbery is not serving anyone except the old boys not even the young boys, the old boys who expect to, the young boys who expect to be old boys one day, you know. Um, and, um, and I think authenticity and, you know, hard work and a modicum of talent is, is then recognized. Um, happily now, when we speak of women's rights, I think that there's a much greater clarity, though not enough clarity, that we are not merely speaking of privileged women. Um, we are not merely speaking of expanding the cake or the pie to those who are privileged male adjacent. You know, for example, women who don't suffer from uh, when they have periods, right? Or women who are upper caste or women who are able-bodied, etc. I think now there's a recognition that rights must be across the board and must be universal. So that when you have someone who is a Dalit woman or a, a disabled woman, say with cerebral palsy or with another disability, then one can't, you know, all our rights are interconnected. That there's no question of just stopping here to the people who are male adjacent. So I think that's something that um, that systems need to be 
le- you know pushed and leveraged and in, in in a much in a much greater way um but mm. also but also you know when we look at climate change for example and women are so much more vulnerable to climate change and climate change litigation is becoming um and i haven't uh, you know, i've been asked to but i haven't done any so far climate change litigation but um when we look at free speech and we look at how digital rights and free speech apply to women and how having a cell phone is something that women have much less and is policed much more because that's the that's actually the portal so often to markets to boyfriends or girlfriends or pa- you know other kinds of other partners to um speech that isn't policed and to a kind of freedom that is an invisible so it's policed much more um the 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 access to cell phones and the use of cell phones when it comes to women so of course you're right everything is interconnected yeah and also i think that as things develop you diversify your um legal interests also yeah. i mean i started as a crim- uh, lawyer practicing in the criminal field uh, then my human rights work as well as uh, the uh, the women's rights litigation that i was doing um also the 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 litigation for the more vulnerable communities like minorities the uh, litigation or or defense of people who were charged with blasphemy these were dangerous fields some of these and of course you may know uh, uh, we knew the danger and we suffered a lot of that kind of danger um but the thing is that now i think that after having done almost a thousand cases so far you know um, in different courts in pakistan i really want to make sure that again as i said this is the uh, 70th year of our uh, no sorry the 50th year of our constitution and i at one of those ceremony, uh, events that i was attending to speak about the 50th 50 years of pakistan's constitution i suddenly it struck me why not make it stronger by using every article of that constitution to make sure that we are not only um, you know strengthening the respect for fundamental rights but also the way that the country is being governed so you know although i've done these cases even before and some of them of course uh, had very profound effects on the way women were empowered and the way governance was affected in this country but you know like you know like uh, this uh, first women bank that um, benazir bhutto had set up for women's economic empowerment somewhere along the road uh, uh, another government thought that uh, this has a great deal of liquidity and there was an advantage in privatizing this uh, bank um of course uh, uh, an idea that didn't spring out of any concern for the uh, people of this country but because you know there was some private concern the uh, interest in that we saved that the women's action forum who i represented in court we saved that particular institution it still runs and is a, a, a source of economic empowerment for women then there were several others but now i think that this this whole issue of making the constitution alive and going to courts to make sure that they are interpreting the constitution in a manner in which governance becomes um uh, more transparent more fair more just and more equal in terms of giving opportunities to everyone so this is something that in my old age i'm now 70 years old or will be in a month or two i really need to concentrate I, i you know i enjoy litigation i enjoy my human rights work as well and i'm engaged on all parts of the world and globally in international human rights and uh, legal issues but i really going, like going to court so if i'm going to reduce anything this is not going to be my litigation A, a, in my post 70 years that i have uh, you know uh, whatever life i have so i do believe that public interest litigation is very important if nothing else you keep the courts ab- uh, apprised of their own responsibility 
to contribute to social change as well as a strong legal framework, a workable legal framework for people. We have a very good article in our constitution. Maybe you have something similar as well, which says that the Supreme Court has original jurisdiction. Yeah. You hear matters where any um, um, of public interest, to hear matters of public interest where the enforcement of fundamental rights is concerned. And we can go straight to the uh, Supreme Court. Unfortunately, in more recent years, it's been pro absolutely misused, both by the Supreme Court itself to uh, enforce their own political uh, views and also by private uh, political elements yeah. to resolve pol political crises and political wrangles. That was not what it was meant to do. It was purely in order to give access straight to the Supreme Court for large areas where you know people's rights were being affected. Uh, people's right to land, people's right to house, people's right to uh, be, be appropriately uh, safeguarded against climate change and the effects of climate change in, in, in there. So I do believe that that's my future agenda. Love you here. 10 Love years you. before you, Church and perhaps here. in your lifetime, you'll have many more uh, new interests uh, and new issues and challenges. But I do believe that what little time I have uh, really must go into making the constitution and the law close to the people. Yeah. And let people <clears throat> not say that the law doesn't work for us, which is the general perception here. I'm yeah. sure it's the same with you as well. Absolutely. I hear, I what, you're saying, like I hear what you're saying because, um, but I think our situation with that direct access to the Supreme Court is not constitutionally maybe so different, but in practice has become somewhat different because uh, under Article 32, you can go directly to the Supreme Court for the enforcement of fundamental rights and Articles 130, uh, uh, 136 and 142 allow a litigant to come to the Supreme Court against any order from any court, and 142 allows the court to do complete justice. The thing, though, is that the Supreme Court now is uh, extremely overburdened. And given the robustness of our high courts and the fact that it, they have um, wider jurisdiction, because under Article 226, I mean, this is for the lawyers, those of you who have too many articles, <laughs> numbers, you know, coming at you, just ignore them. But high courts have the ability to also look at legality, to look at whether discretion has been exercised in a reasonable manner uh, under a statute, say, or whether an issue is ultra vires, uh, whether an action of the state is ultra vires, a statute or not. So it means that um, one is going with the entire slew of arguments. So therefore, in, a, you know, the some of our very important cases that are pending now, uh, the marital rape case, for example, we chose to go to the high court at the first instance. Right. Um, it really I'm benefited. not saying that we go directly to the Supreme Court all the time. Right. Uh, high courts are doing their bit as well. They also have writ jurisdiction. But right. what I'm saying is that there is, there is that opportunity. Yeah. yeah, and we've also been asking for a constitutional court in Pakistan to yeah. to unburden the Supreme Court. At the moment, we are feeling this so acutely because the Supreme Court is so busy in doing political cases that a lot of our other cases are still pending. There's a 60,000 back, uh, case backlog in, in, in the Pakistan Supreme Court, yeah. which means that many of my clients who are rotting in jail in, in death cells, whose uh, death sentences have been you know, confirmed by the high court and they're still waiting for the Supreme Court to hear their final appeals. Yeah. Um, and, you know, when you say that bringing the law to the people, I think that one of the things that is most important, and um, I did a workshop with, uh, you know, for the UN in Kathmandu, as you were saying, Kathmandu is a place that all of South Asia can gather, where we were looking at juvenile justice, which is a separate issue, but we worked with judges and ombuds people and government people from across the eight countries 
to look at how to bring rights home. And one of the most important things, I think, is to get the various stakeholders together and um, is to cost, is to have all the stakeholders to sit together and to um, look at what it is that each stakeholder must do to make that law a reality. And then to say, what is it that we need? I mean, do we need more police personnel? Should those police personnel be women? Should, when recruiting them, should we be not asking, kat kitna hai, chodai kitni hai? Should we be saying, what is your allegiance to constitutional values and to um, working to empower the disempowered? Because otherwise, the state just becomes an additionally, uh, a bigger stick uh, against the disempowered. To cost all of that, to pass a finance bill that uh, brings funds for that training or chairs and tables or additional building, to look, for example, at roads, um, because distance is gendered. So for to allow little girls to go to school, for example, um, water is gendered. Because if that child's responsibility is to bring water, then um, the closeness of the water might determine whether she's going to school or not. So all of these things, I think none of it is rocket science. And I do think that is the responsibility of our governments to take down patriarchy. Because mm -hmm. we have sovereign democratic uh, constitutional governments now that uh, their primary task, I guess, is to guarantee, um, is to protect us from war, right? But surely, I mean, that's, you know, that's what a country is primarily based on. And of course, in, its, in the name of that, there's a lot that is said that is incorrect. But um, if the idea is to protect citizens from death or injury, then surely women's bodily integrity should have the same priority and women, and, and it absolutely hasn't happened. So when we speak of, uh, when we speak of independence, the fact that women's independence and queer people's independence has not progressed anywhere to that degree makes me really think that, and has in some ways gone back. If you look, for example, at the uh, women's labor workforce participation rate, which the government has suddenly said has risen, has risen to 33%, but it hasn't. They've just changed the way that they measure it. Um, I think we all need to, as a you know, global polity of women and queer folk, start to think about hacks, hacks that cannot be rolled back. And of course, the constitutions uh, of our countries and laws are, are some of those hacks. Those are harder to roll back. But, um, but that, I think, has got to, got to be a priority because there's so much movement the other way. Now, I see that there are a lot of people wanting to ask us questions, and we only have eight minutes left, so I'm going to ask you some questions. May, may I just intervene to say at the end that I think that bo in both our countries, the way that the social trends are moving, work yeah. that the kind of work that we do, both in our countries at the regional level and at the international level, is going to become more and more difficult with the level of tolerance going down, the respect for diversity waning in both our countries, the uh, uh, you know the, the the rights of minorities and this rays of religiosity not religion but religiosity i think this is going to um, uh, have a very very difficult uh, give give us a very difficult environment to work in both for uh, human rights and both and for the rule of law in this in both our countries so let's hope we can work uh, and continue our work and gather more and more speed in bringing about change. Yes. So this Bonaventure Stephen Gomes is asking, as corporates must publish reports on accounts, environment, sustainability, governance, uh, it must be mandated on compliance with human rights across all tiers of their business. 
uh, well, they are required to publish, Stephen, they are required to publish um, in their annual reports what they've done with regard to uh, the prevention of sexual harassment uh, and how many complaints there have been and whether they've held workshops, whether they have their... Um, but in terms of human rights, is that something you think that's important, Hina? I mean, maybe trans whatever they think that they... Whenever they think they violated human rights, should a corporate report it? I think I think they it, it, this is part of corporate responsibility that they keep to the norms and keep to the law and uh, respect for human rights. But I don't think that you can force them to report it themselves. Uh, but there must be oversight mechanisms where this corporate responsibility. Um, uh, or to adhere to laws, to, um, to uh, human rights and respect for human rights and the fundamental freedoms in, in, the, in the national constitutions. I think there must be a good oversight system and there is. There are in many countries, uh, even countries like ours. The only problem is that the strong influence of big corporations sometimes uh, you know, make make governments hesitant to keep a vigilant eye on what uh, is happening. Uh, I've seen that in my country, um, uh, illegal land, land occupations by big corporate. They hold, this country is one of the um, 10 countries where climate change is, going, is the most, uh, you know, it's, it's going to affect us the most. There are, there are, you know, corporates who are doing things uh, to to increase the effects of climate change uh, with impunity. There are environmental issues. We invite people to kill our uh, endangered species uh, as an entertainment. So these are some of the things we have to understand that uh, states are responsible for it. We, as human rights defenders, or citizens in general can raise our voices. But at the same time, we need to make sure, and that's why I kept saying that this is my next agenda to ensure good governance, that when we raise our voices, there is no option but for governments to respond. You know, since you were talking about uh, strengthening constitutions, I also think that the time that uh, our constitutions were drafted was, and you know, I think we have a very robust constitution uh, and a very important one, but there's also particular gaps. So when we speak of individual rights, then um, and from largely a construct that emerges from liberalism, um, the gaps that remain are really gaps in terms of de facto power. And when de facto power is with corporates and when corporates own um, and high net worth individuals own by far the largest percentage of GDP um, and the measure of success of the economy is GDP, already you have a very chapeau level problem. When you couple that with the fact that there is uh, in this country, very strongly, but also in many other countries, um, the, the lack of transparency in corporate donations to political parties. In fact, it's a complete black box. Um, there you have it. And so structural reform then, um, and root and branch reform to put the citizen at the center of governance, I think, yeah. back in the center of that governance, then becomes something that's um, really vital. I think that the organizers are saying that we only have two minutes left. So um, can we hear from you, Hina, and then I will also speak on the same subject. I don't know where I am on it today, but what inspires you most today? What keeps you going? 
I don't know um, what keeps me going. I don't think that um, at any period in, the, in, in Pakistan have I ever had an environment which has inspired me in the work that I do. I've only felt uh, always that there is no option but to keep struggling because as long as we struggle, there is still hope. So my, my uh, faith is always in my struggle, not necessarily on whether I will achieve the goals that I have set for myself. But I've always had my eye on the one step forward, even though sometimes we have to go two steps backwards. But um, but I think, uh, so, it, so it's not inspiration, but the compulsion to go forward because there is no other option. I think I agree with that. I think that there is no option but to hope. And there's so much goodness in the world. And also, it's not that people who do bad things are bad people. They're doing bad things. So there is humanity in everybody. My, uh, my mother used to always say about Hitler that, but he had a parrot he was very nice to. I mean, I don't know if this is true or not, you know. <laughs> but when... The arc of history will only bend towards justice if we bend it towards justice. And every little bit that we do individually and collectively, every day, will have some effect that may do it, in some cases, to a great extent. Um, thank you, Asia Society, for having us. Thank you, Hina, for being inspirational yourself. Thank you so much.